The views and opinions expressed in the following podcast do not necessarily reflect those of the producers, the affiliates, or digital platforms hosting this podcast. All content is for the purposes of education, conjecture, and at times entertainment. We promote inclusiveness and diversity. Enjoy the show. Welcome to Into the Deep with Jay Casta. Welcome to Into the Deep. I'm Jay Costa. In the early 1970s, strange noises, what is said to be Sasquatch communications, were recorded in the Sierra Nevada mountains. These communications were allegedly made by a group of Sasquatch in the woods around the hunting camp and subsequently transcribed and analyzed by cryptolinguists. These recordings soon become known as the Sierra Sounds. Today's guest is an author and has been known for decades for his worldwide research into Bigfoot and Sasquatch phenomena. To date, he comes closer than any other researcher to having a complete body of evidence. Today's guest is Ron Moorhead. Ron has documented his personal interactions with these giant beings and produced a myriad of writings, some in the form of books, as well as recordings. We talk about so many things like the possibility of connections between Bigfoot and the skeletons found in Peru and in Bolivia. So, without further ado, it is my honor to ask you to join me as we seek light and journey into the deep with Ron Moorhead. Enjoy. Ron, uh, thank you so much for joining us, man. I Truly appreciate you taking the time, man. Uh, you've been, gosh, you've been spearheading uh, so much investigative research with Bigfoot, Sasquatch, and uh, just really, we're honored to have you on the show, man. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. I appreciate being invited. Uh, so if you could, for our listeners uh, and our viewers, could you tell them who you are and what it is you do? Uh, my name is Ron Moorhead. I'm uh, kind of retired. I'm uh, <laughs> Years ago, in 1971, I got a... I got invited to a, a hunting camp way in the wilderness of Sierra Nevada mountains of California from a, a guy who didn't want to go back by himself because he was one of the hunters up there in this remote area. And uh, anyway, the guys got uh, approached by something huge. Uh, they weren't looking for Bigfoot to the hunting camp since 1958. This guy got freaked out and he came out and he, you know, the guys were late coming back. So he wise wanted him to go back and check on the guys at that time you don't know what you're dealing with they saw some kind of a monster and he said yeah the johnson brothers were right there's some kind of monster up there and i'm not going back but he went back if i would go with him so that's how i got involved in 71 and and uh, they were okay obviously and didn't get eaten or carried away or nothing like that so it just kind of spearheaded to what i'm doing today which is just investigating i've been pretty much around the world uh, looking at different enigmas and things that are associated with this this being they call bigfoot sasquatch and uh, we was able in 1972 to uh we contacted see 71 yeah, winter of 71 and contact ivan sanderson a cryptozoologist who's now passed away but he he thought it was probably a hoax he sent it to a guy named peter byrne on the west coast and peter i've known for years now he thought probably the same thing it was, he didn't well, probably he did think it was and i read the communications before <laughs> between them later on because we did we knew it wasn't a hoax we didn't think so anyway anyway al Berry got a hold of it in california from peter byrne he was an investigative reporter working for a newspaper at the time he thought well i'll go down and talk to these guys see whose leg they're pulling anyway we ended up inviting him into camp he interviewed us and heard the sounds we'd started recording that year and uh, he just uh was invited and he he fostered and uh, spearheaded the uh the studies we had done on these sounds which was done by professor curlin at the university of wyoming and uh well, that's how it started out he showed that they were outside the human range that they were original they were not manipulated were not speeded up slowed down no 60 cycle hum which would have shown pre-recording re-recording at different speeds all that stuff so he uh, he a professor of electrical engineering at the university of wyoming at the time so he was it was pretty good but it wasn't enough to sway any academia's sway towards are these things real or not but right. 
But it wasn't until uh, later on when uh, uh, Scott Nelson, cryptozoologist trained by the Navy as a cryptozoologist to uh, check into different languages and see if it is a language, number one, see if there's any coding in it, see if there's any uh, deception in it. Uh, he was trained for his career as that. And he... Uh, he attested, no, these are these are real. No human can duplicate these. They're stepping on each other. They're outside the human range. That is a language by the human definition of language. So that spirit, another thing going on with me. And I ran across uh, uh, another very important person, which was because uh, they're outside the human range, right? Or they're also inside the human range. I have a very expansive vocal mechanism. And uh, I found uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Lieberman at Brown University. And uh, Dr. Lieberman quotes that only humans have the vocal mechanism for language. So that brings it to another level, uh, in my opinion. It, it, it means they, they are a, a part human or they have a human component to them, which means 23 chrom prayers of chromosomes, all that stuff. So eons and eons have passed since these things have probably been around. They're a little more advanced than most people want to give them credit for, a lot more actually. And uh, we underestimated what we're dealing with at the time. Uh, started going back there uh, year after year and uh, recording them and getting a lot of uh, data that way. So anyway, uh, that's that's it in a nutshell, but we can go on from there because it's taken me some pretty interesting thoughts on the matter of how they do this strangeness that they do because because they do do strangeness. Doo -doo. Is that a good word, doo doo? <laughs> yeah, doo doo is a good word as long as you're not stepping in it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because I, I find that so fascinating with uh, with your book, Quantum Bigfoot. You get into how this interconnectedness between the relation of quantum physics and how these beings are possibly tapped into it. I think so. I think we all have that ability, but uh, we haven't evolved that far. And that kind of puts it to another level. Have these things evolved further than we have, at least the ones we dealt with. I can only speak for that because I dealt with them for a long time and, and interacted with them. and. Uh, it was uh, quite an uh, interesting part of my life. But yeah, it got me into science. Uh, actually, Al Berry, he had a master's degree in science. He's the investigative guy we took in 72. And he, he said, if you're going to talk about any of this stuff, stay with science. So for a long time, we didn't talk about the strangeness that went on, the lights, the sounds that we couldn't find the source of, not, not the vocalizations, but other sounds. And so um, I got me into quantum physics and uh, that, because I was raised religiously in a church and I, I, uh, I knew texts and scriptures pretty well, and I didn't really follow everything that was going on in religions. So I, I'm not a religious person now, but I am a spiritual person, like we all are, whether we like it or not, because physics says that uh, energy, which we're all made of at the most minute level of our existence, we are energy vibrating at a frequency. That's string theory. And uh, anyway, it's been established there's more dimensions than the three that we live in. And if you can get out of that with your head and not create yourself, put yourself in a box, you you can understand this stuff. It's not really not that deep. Well, it's deep. Don't get me wrong. You can't find the end of the universe, right? <laughs> right. And you don't understand time the way it's really working. Uh, we only perceive it in our third dimensional reality. So anyway, um, uh, energy, which we're all made of, as I said, cannot die can only change forms now religion says okay i'm going to go to heaven when i die or maybe not but that's what most people hope for me but uh, physicists will say you're going to just change into another form go into another dimension well there you go so that kind of couples a lot of things we learned about the masters of old you know what they were saying why we can do what they did how you know, but we're not doing it you know i haven't learned how to turn water into wine yet right and i haven't walked on water uh try but get wet <laughs> try <all this> stuff. <laughs> so, anyway it's it's been a venture and uh, yeah. there's a lot going on and i'm kind of holding you up from asking me questions probably but uh this is where it goes with me and uh i i uh, I, I quote tesla uh, you know he he said what one man calls god another man calls quantum physics so you know, a lot of people say well he's in the woo he's crazy well that's because they can't get out of their box and they're not thinking outside the box they're just in their paradigm have been taught Newtonian physics <clears throat> since this came out in 1687, which is great. There's nothing wrong with that because it works in our 3D reality. However, there's more going on. We know that now. Mathematically, it's accepted by a physicist. It's, it's only about 100 years old. You know, uh, Max Pock uh, got a Nobel Prize for that in, in uh, 1918. So 
really uh, it's 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 new and it's called modern physics and it, it kind of rides on the back of of uh, newtonian physics it, it's 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 it works and so many people say well it only works in the micro world well that's bs i mean <laughs> according to dr christopher blair west texas a&m he says quantum physics is is active from the atom through the stars and it works everywhere and i've thought that all the time because i got a call on carpet well it only works in the micro world well no it works in the macro world also and uh, i think if we learn to understand that there's other things we just don't see like we don't we don't see everything. We only see within light's frequency. Everything's frequency, energy, and vibration. Well, you only see it's a 440 terahertz to 770 terahertz, but all these other frequencies are out there that you're not seeing, but that's light's frequency. That's what we're made in our, in our reality to see. That's all we can see. Unless you communicate with the third eye, <laughs> right. which is doesn't require light, right? So it's a receptor, in my opinion. And uh, I think uh, it goes on deeper. You know, you got to get the coherence going with the, the heart. When somebody said, well, I had a gut feeling, I should have went over there. Well, you got to go by that gut feeling, in my opinion. Because if it's a coherence with your heart and your, and your brain, and you connect with the pineal gland, everything's going to be good for you. I mean, everything's going to be good for you. You got to raise your vibrational frequency because you all have one. And it just goes higher and higher the better you get. I say better, it's, it's just more, uh, more believing. Uh, in what's really going on in the universe the universe is a collectiveness and it's we're all part of that if we just learn how to communicate and connect with it so i'll love shut that. up for a second no no this is great it's super conversational this is it we're, we're here to listen so i think it's wonderful and especially like just the correlations between that energy and that consciousness and and light frequency vibration and understanding that it's a a deeper world around us than we really can comprehend and perceive. Yeah. yeah. Well, like I say, uh, Newtonian, uh, Newtonian physics is based on everything that's physical and material and predictable. And uh, where quantum physics isn't, it, it just isn't. You can't, you can't put a finger on it really, other than you can, you can conceive it and understand it. And mathematically, it's been established. So I think we have to go with that. And I think pretty much everybody needs to look into that if they want to know what's going on, because What's really going on in the universe is much bigger than our 3D little bubble we live in down here. And uh, I believe in UFOs. I believe in aliens. I've seen remnants. I've been all over the world looking at stuff. And uh, I think Peru and Bolivia opened my mind up better than anything because I've seen, I seen those megalithic structures. I've seen how, how could they have been made. I mean, you know, you see those boulders over 200 tons and over 100 tons way over 100 tons yeah. and uh, they're they're taken up on this 13,000 foot mountain put together like a jigsaw puzzle with no mortar oh come on how's that happen we can't do that today you know but uh it's really just like a jigsaw puzzle i mean just all these little serious boulders you know how'd they do that well we don't have that technology so something with a higher technology has been on this planet and uh, in eons, and I mean, we're talking about eons of time. So it kind of opens your mind up a little bit to the, wow, yeah, there's really something going on that we don't have a handle on yet. But now I think it's being uh, told about more and more all over the world. Brian uh, Forrester, who I've been with a couple of times in South America, he's he's gets around and uh, he's also a guide down there. And he just he took us around. I was with two different scientists on two different trips and studying the elongated skulls. I, I was my interest at that time was to see if the, the elongated skull could be connected to the sagittal crest that they often report on Bigfoot up here. So there was a crumb trail, a crumb trail from the uh, from the pre-Inca people, or from the Incas, I should say, uh, which were after the pre-Inca people. <laughs> Paracas people, they call them, who did the megalithic structures. By the way, the head binding, they say, oh, it's just head binding. You know, the Incas did head binding. Well, yes, they did do head binding. But we, we believe that they were doing head binding to mimic what the pre Inca people were attributed for, to, uh, which were the megalithic structures and just the stuff went on down there because it's all over Peru and South America. And I flew over the Nazca lines too, and just seeing that stuff with your own eyes, it just blows your mind i mean you you got to really then you got to open your mind you can't help it because then your eyes your 3d eyes see the stuff that was done <laughs> yeah the crumb trail took me to central america where the mayans and the aztec uh, 
uh, fought with the uh, giants in the north, and the Incas had fought with them. They warred with the giants of the north, which took me to Lovelock Caves. I've been there four times, and that's in Nevada. And looking for the elongated skulls, or the skulls they said was attributed to the uh, by the Paiutes, said that they warred with giant red-haired cannibals, human type two mm. Bigfoots. <laughs> well, I shouldn't say Bigfoots. Don't know what they were, but they were, according to Sarah Winnemacher, who wrote about it in her book. Uh, she she said they were cannibalistic giants, red hair. So that kind of wonders, well, did they really kill them all off like they said they did in, in the fire, they said, to the Lovelock Cave, or did some of them get around? Or was there others that they just didn't get because there was evidently a lot of that going on for a long time. So the Paiutes all got together and, and uh, tried to eliminate them. I would, too, if they tried to eat me. You know, I would have done that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I, I I go back a little bit deeper with some of this stuff because I think there's more than one kind of these things that call Bigfoot Sasquatch. I don't think they're all the same genome necessarily. I think, well, they may be partially. I believe in aliens. I believe in the alien uh, involvement, intervention, and mm -hmm. manipulation of the human genome and of different species genome. And why are they doing that? Why have they done that in the past? Uh, why are they doing it possibly now? Um, possibly to acclimate their uh, their species to this environment. Uh, there's supposedly a lot of hybrids running around, which is what I'm hearing, but uh, maybe they don't even know it. But uh, <laughs> right. But uh, anyway, uh, that's where I go with it, too. And it's, it's kind of hard for some people to get their head around some of this stuff, but I think they just have to, I would hope they would just listen to broadcasts like this and maybe open their minds up to the possibility that aliens are here. They have been here. Well, we can believe them now. Our government says it's okay, right? Right. Yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's okay to believe in aliens now. I mean, before, <laughs> 10 years ago, we've been laughed off the planet, you know, right, right. but it's okay now. And yet there was some very interesting, mystical, uh, uncanny stuff that went on with us up there. And still does. I mean, I was up there as recently as 2018, but in 2016, uh, we seen some uh, very anomalous light by us. Uh, me and my wife was there, and we was in a little tent, and it was dark, and I seen this elongated light, about probably three, four foot long, uh, glowing, just working through the trees. And <laughs> what do you do with that? I mean, I'm sitting there with nothing but a pea shooter to screw off the bear or something. And, this, uh, I think it's a source of energy. Uh, it didn't really scare us, but it gave me some concern because don't, you don't know the intent. You don't know what it's doing. You don't know what it's for. But we watched it for several seconds, uh, maybe up to a minute. I'm not sure. We didn't. I wasn't timing my watch enough at the time. But uh, that's the last thing. And I, I went back up there in 2018 with uh, David Polites, who did the missing form, one the hunted, and he did a 15 minute section on on the Sierra Camp. Which uh, and they um, uh, made a uh, he his cameraman did a really good uh, representation of what we saw in 2016, two years before, and it's in that film, Missing 401, The Hunted. And uh, so anyway, the anomalies associated with these beings that we were experiencing during the 70s up there, uh, things are still going on. I'm not sure what to make of it all other than I think it's just energy. These things are energy, like we all are energy at our most minute level. And what can they do and how do they do what people say they do? Because now I've been interviewing people for 50 years. It's a long time to be associated with this anomaly. A lot of people say, and they were heartfelt people that thought, not thought, they said, I saw it disappear. It just disappeared. And then you find some other people who say, oh, the trackway stopped. It can't be real. Nothing can just stop unless a helicopter picked them up. You know, well, they're thinking inside their box. It has to be a helicopter. It can't be anything else, right? right? If their trackway stopped, okay, they backed out of their tracks. Well, no. you got a bunch of tracks in the snow. <laughs> snow. You don't just back out of them. You know, why would you do that anyway <laughs> without leaving some type of a sign? So anyway, quantum physics will answer that for us. I think if they have learned through vibrational frequency how to change their matter into energy, they will disappear for our, from our eyes. Uh, the trackways will, they will have no more density, so the trackways would stop. Uh, there's answers to everything. Just have to look deeper and find out how they could be. 
uh, people want to call me woo woo or you know it's a paranormal. So, well, what is paranormal? It's just what we don't understand. I think we just have to research and look and see how to understand it. That's what I've been trying to do now for fifty years. And uh, I think I'm putting the dots together, but then everybody's got to put their own dots together. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. And you touched upon a few things there, like where, you know, thinking about them as, you know, these different types of these beings, um, you know, are they left over? Like, you know, it begs all these questions, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. does it tie in with, you know, tales of the Anunnaki? Does it tie in with, you know, yeah, you yeah, know, good you know, beings coming in, like you said, uh, you know, tampering with DNA. And now we have a couple of different results or maybe a couple of different test subjects. Is that kind of the trajectory you're thinking along? Yeah. Uh, also, I think a lot of them have uh, crossbred with native indigenous people, and that would make some of them more human-like. It mm. goes on and on. That would make the trackways appear differently. Like our trackways so consistently over the years up there have been the same, very splayed, very much larger. Uh, so I'm not sure what we're dealing with, what you want to call them. They had a Bigfoot, obviously, Bigfoot. So we, everybody refers to them as Bigfoot or Sasquatch. But uh, the Patterson film from 1967, uh, the trackways there didn't appear to be near like ours. You know, they're more human-like. So it, it takes me to thinking that, you know, there's a lot of Native American lore, too, that says they were taking their women, they crossbreeding. And, and if that was happening then that would account for a lot of differences in them. Some of them may have different attributes. I'm not sure all of them can talk. Like ours have a language by the human definition of language. That's been determined by professional studies. So when you get into that, uh, you got to kind of, they got a human component to them, in my opinion. Well, in science, really. I don't have to really try to prove to people these things exist. And that's the hardest part because the other guys are with me up there. You know, some of them have passed away now, but I was talking to my good friend, Bill, just a few months ago. And he, I said, Bill, you, he never would want to come with me on my talks or anything. <laughs> and he don't want to be interviewed. He said, no, he says, well, first of all, he's still a major church uh, member. And he, uh, it's, it's hard for get religious people to step out of that box that they're in. And they are in, most of them are in a box, I gotta tell you. They've been trained and brainwashed. And I was trained, but I didn't get totally brainwashed. I had to keep an open mind. And I don't mean to down that. Uh, religion is, is good for a lot of people. It's a good thing to have. Uh, it keeps everybody together. But still, uh, it's hard to talk to those people. <laughs> I tried to present my program to church one time. Man, everybody said that their arms crossed and they're looking like this guy. <laughs> he started talking because you can't get out of their their paradigm, and right. uh, uh, that's just, uh, in my opinion, uh, every governmental agency since the beginning of time controls the people. You know, if you're, if you're, no matter what time it was, uh, whoever's writing the, the books is going to, you know, whoever the government agency is is going to control the narrative, and that's happening today. Just like, you know, we know now that the Roswell is that was not a balloon. <laughs> Come on. Right. Oh, that was just a balloon. <laughs> <laughs> Look no. at this wonderful candid picture, you know, on, yeah. a, on a headline. Yeah. Now it's a weather balloon. It's, it's yeah. fine. Well, it's, it's too bad, but the government uh, does that. They always will. They always have. They want control, and they're going to control the narrative. And what would happen if they, if they came out with what? Because I think they know about these beings. I'm quite sure they do. Yeah. What would happen if they came out with what they are? And it would scare a lot of people. It would take a lot of uh, the accepted narrative out of the biblical teachings. It would take Darwinism back a step because Darwinism, Darwinism is not complete. You know, there's no doubt that troglodytes were here. They were here. But what happened? Did something mis manipulate the DNA of a troglodyte and create these beings? Did something manipulate the troglodyte and create us? I mean, what are we? Mm. Biblical speaking, and if you go really research into the biblical teachings, which I've done, um, God is plural. <laughs> right. And if you go God is plural, then you see other places where God is light. Well, take all that and put it together. You just got to put all these dots together, and you find beings from the light, which is the highest dimension, I think the highest frequency you can get, created us in their image. So that means we are very special. I think humans are extremely special, and, and uh, that's, I don't think anything's supposed to interfere with us. Now, these things interfere with us, but I don't think they were supposed to, but they did. We recorded it, and uh, everything has a choice, no matter where you are or who you are. 
So aliens have a choice. They can mess with us or, or not. I think some of them are here now. I'm quite sure that a lot of them probably live underwater in their own environment. And, uh, you know, even Christopher Columbus seen some disc coming out of the water. He wrote that in his logs. Right. <laughs> there you go. You know, it, it's all coming together. And I think we're going to be, uh, it's going to be revealed to us big time here before too long. I couldn't agree more. The When you bring that up, even just about like the historical, uh, I guess, you know, the stories that we've heard, whether it's folklore, whether mm -hmm. it's, you know, historical <clears throat> records or people's journals where they're talking of either like large, massive, you know, humanoid figures or even these light beings or as indigenous talk about, you know, star people. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like, you know, 50 years ago when you were first getting involved with all of this versus now, you, what are your feelings on how people have come to be more open-minded and more, more open-hearted to these possibilities that they weren't maybe 50, 40, 30, or even 20 years ago? Yeah. Well, you got, you got the media now, but mm -hmm. you've got this social, this type of media we're doing now, these broadcasts or programs, the information is getting out and they can help it. You know, there's thousands of reports of Bigfoot or Sasquatch and Dogman, you get into all those things, but what's really going on and what kind of attributes do they have? My feelings are that, uh, you know, I think people are becoming more inundated with it, more acceptable to maybe, yeah, maybe more and more percentages of people believe that they're here. Mm -hmm. But then like my friend Bill said last year, when I talked to him, he's you know, it's hard enough to get people to believe in Bigfoot, much less tell them about the crazy stuff that happened with us there. So, <laughs> so he don't need to go with there, you know, just let it ride. And a lot of people, you know, believe me, but they don't want to get involved in it because they just, mm, they don't want to get laughed at. I don't mm -hmm. care anymore. And I'm pushing 80. I'll be 80 years old this year. And I don't care. I'm just going to say what I think and what I believe and what I've researched. And you guys can take it, do what you want to go in one ear and out the other, or it can stay there and you can think about it. I just encourage people to learn how the pituitary or not pituitary, but the pineal gland works, how you decalcify because that, that gives us our intuitiveness. Uh, there's just a lot going on that we need to learn. And I'm still learning. I certainly haven't learned everything. Uh, it's just important that we learn what makes our vibrational frequency get higher. So we can, when we do pass into another form, we can get into a better form. You know? <laughs> and that's by responding to our experiences. And that's what life is about, in my opinion is experiences but more importantly is how you respond to the experiences are you are you responding to them negatively or are you taking them as a as a uh, victim do you think you're a victim because something happened to you or did you need to experience that to respond to it differently i think if we respond to everything with love and compassion we're going to raise our frequency and that's important and then we'll evolve better and you evolved as a person. I believe in multiple embodiments. I'm sorry, but most a lot of religions just wipe me off the board right there. But I don't care. It makes so much sense and it fits mm -hmm. with everything. Uh, you, if you haven't learned, you're going to have to learn sometime sooner or later. That's just the way it goes. And if you come back, you're going to be approached with different situations, different experiences, and you've got to learn to respond to them with compassion and, and love. And some old woman gets in front of you in a car and she's doubled her medication. She just sit there at the green light and won't move. You know, you got to have compassion for that person. I yes. might be that person. So have compassion for it. <laughs> it might be Ron. Okay. <laughs> <It> might, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Anyway, it's all fun. And it's all good. And uh, by raising your vibrational frequency and not becoming a victim of whatever negative, or what you think is a negative circumstance, you will get a, be a better person. You'll be healthier because everything's going good. I mean, it just goes better all the way around. But the main thing is clean up your diet so you can receive those things through your pineal gland. Get your heart and brain coherence going in a bright sequence. That's where the chakra comes in. That's where balancing your, your body comes in. And that's written about for eons. And yeah. It really comes to life when you get in studying this stuff. What we're able to do as humans, we just need to evolve better. So there. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> And, and what, and I, I mean, my surmise is that you got on this path, f you know, from all your research. And were you always thinking in this way? No, heavens no. 
No, I didn't until I started trying to figure out how this stuff happened to us up there. You know, when you hear you can't be inside the shelter and you hear these things out there and you hear you can't be in tore apart, you think it's being tore apart. You know, the, the stove area and all the stuff we brought in being ripped and torn and thrown around. And you look out there after it's over with and nothing's changed. You know, how do you put a finger on that one? Uh, what do you do? And most, you know, we just put it up on the shelf, let it lay there because <laughs> you can't figure it out. But like Al says, stay with science. So I think the science that answers so many of these anomalies, like the lights we saw, I saw a UFO coming down one time up there. And, and uh, you just got to keep science with it. And I think quantum physics gets into that. And it's not that hard, really. Just get some books and start reading. There's a lot of books on quantum physics and quantum mechanics. And uh, I want to bring up this. So in 1880, actually in 2012, in the Huffington Post, there's an article about something that came out in 1888 in the Eureka Times, I think it was, or somewhere right in there, newspaper that said um, there was a big moon come down and three crazy bears jumped out of it. <laughs> and that was witnessed by ranchers and some Native Americans. And, you know, that's one of the first accounts of UFOs being involved with these creatures or with something that appeared to be probably was reporting Bigfoot. So and about 20% of the uh, of the accounts of Bigfoots have a UFO component to them, as does mine. And uh, you hear this big uh, tuning fork above your head in the daytime, and you can't see it. Well, how do they cloak? They cloak through the laws of quantum physics. How did Jesus do his miracles? He says, we can do them through the laws of quantum physics. And it's really, you just have to become one, as he was, Come one with the universe, and that's what we need to learn to do. You do that through meditation, and I think, and, and opening your mind. So there again. Yeah. <laughs> it's not even Sunday. I could talk like this. <laughs> <laughs> it's your Sunday sermon with Ron Red. <laughs> well, it's, I think it's great uh, that you know we're, we're at a time in a, in a culture that's there's more more individuals that are able to accept some of these belief systems mm -hmm. or, you know, question past belief systems. Um, and really, like you said, get outside of that box. Oh, that's what, important. Yeah. This new shifting paradigm. What are some, what are some other experiences that for you, you just knew beyond the shadow of a doubt, like this is, this is something profound <laughs> and it's moving things in it. Well, unfortunately, in the 70s, early 70s, we was looking for the ape in the woods, like so many people are, if, if they're looking for it at all. And uh, we were thinking there's some kind of unique ape, but something strange is happening around them, you know. So, again, you put those strange things up on the shelf because you're trying to just experience what's going on. And uh, it wasn't until 74 when I started interacting with them, uh, more so, uh, and uh, they started interacting with us while we're outside our shelter, which is the first. We usually wait till we was inside before they would uh, start jabbering and making their sounds. And, uh, but 74 was a, a good year for this. We, we packed up our mules, my friend Bill and I. We were going in uh, with supplies uh, to take into our camp. And we uh, started off early and about oh, just a little ways up the trail, our horses bolted. Uh, not bolted, but just horses and mule jumped around. Well, I didn't think much of that. It could have been a bear, it could have been a deer. There's a lot of bear up there, a lot of deer up there, too. It makes it such a good hunting camp for the guys. And uh, anyway, uh, kept going another hour up the trail. I see this big five toed track, right? Perpendicular to the trail. Just walk right to. Whoa, look at that. And I was the lead guy. I mean, Bill was one of two guys. And I watched, watch for stuff like that. And I seen this. And I stopped, took a picture of it. And, wiped it out and kept going no one else had been on the trail that we that i saw you know tracks were signs well we got into camp and uh these things were already in camp they were already there didn't know that at the time but as soon as it started getting dark which wasn't that much longer i was fixing our meal at the stove and bill was doing something with the horses and and we started hearing these whoops and wood cracking you know it's this Crack with a definition. It's not just a pop like something stepped on something. It's a big whop, you know. Then you hear the rock clacking and uh, stuff like that. So I got to my saddlebag, pulled out my recorder, and started recording all this. Well, that's when they started yelling something at me, and I started trying to mimic them back. 
they were asking me something. I had no idea what it was. To this day, I don't know what it is because the, the crypto linguist only transcribed language. He did not translate a language. So we don't know what they were saying. Uh, I have a lot of people chime in. So I don't know what they're saying. I don't know what they're saying. Well, they're all saying, telling me something different. They know the context. Until they can tell me the context and give me something reasonable, you don't know who to believe. So I don't believe any of them until <laughs> till I know something better, uh, if I ever know. Uh, but they were trying to say something to me. The crypto linguist says that they slowed their vocalizations down, he believes, into something that maybe we could understand. Because the rapid chatter we recorded in 71, 72, uh, and the, the sounds that I was recording in 74 were, were a little different, but they were slowed down. And uh, so I'm not sure what was going on, maybe so I could talk with you today, you know, just so I could let what words led me. Because this has led me on a path of understanding that what's really going on or what I think is going on. And maybe if I can relay this to people out there and give some researchers even a, a better line on on what to think and just keep an open mind when you're out in the woods uh, and not try to put these things in a box that you're in. Uh, that's, I think, my duty as a as a human being on this planet right now, I guess, because this is all I do. I stopped my uh, businesses in, uh, several years ago and just do this all the time, go to conferences and talk on broadcast so it's it's fun i gotta tell you it is a lot of it's 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 because it's, it's, it's so interesting that's right. why i talk so fast right now because usually i don't talk this fast it's but great that's coffee this morning too <laughs> i've got mine right here so yeah <laughs> yeah i need more <laughs> i <can> talk faster <laughs> anyway uh i i i got a lot of thoughts on this and i present in the powerpoint program when i go to these conventions let's go through with one weekend before this Last one, yeah. Yeah, you lose track of this. In Washington. I live in North Carolina now. Okay. Right and uh, moved back here. So I'm on Eastern time. I yeah. kind of throws a curve into some of these broadcasts because a lot of people on the West Coast want to interview mm -hmm. me or something. And it's three hours difference in time. And, and I said, well, we'll be on at 7 o'clock tonight, Pacific time. <laughs> here it is, 10 o'clock back here, my bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> right. So it, it, it's thrown a little curve that way at me, but... Uh, I, I love to do it, so I stay up and do it whenever they ask me because I feel like it, it needs to be said, and uh, well, that's just how I feel. So I'm going to say what I think, and and there you are. I love that. I, you know, I'm also on the East Coast as well. Uh, oh, I'm in, perfect. I'm in, I'm in the Northeast, so uh, I'm, I'm in Rhode Island. So have you had any yeah. uh, any anything brought you to like maybe like the, the Green Mountains or the White Mountains of Vermont? Or Not yet. You know, last year I spoke in Gallenberg. And I spoke in uh, Lexicon, Kentucky. I spoke in Michigan and uh, some other state back here. But uh, that's what I've been doing back here. And mm -hmm. uh, that's all. I have not got out in the woods or done any really thing here. Right. Uh, just haven't got hooked in with anybody here yet to, to be with them. Yeah. I will eventually because we like it here. The weather's really good where we live by White Lake. And... Uh, it's just, uh, I'm a Pacific Northwest guy, though. Normally, I was raised in California, took up in Oregon and Washington several years ago. And I, I love the Pacific Northwest, and there's a lot of activity there. But, you know, you talk about Bigfoot back here, and they get you. I mean, it's it's okay. They believe it. At least the people, when I mention, I don't push it. I don't push it at all. I, they want to know what I do. I say, well, I'm into hominology. That throws them for a loop right there. <laughs> <laughs> so they're afraid to ask me what that means <laughs> uh, but i i will talk to people that i know if they if they ask me but I, i'm not pushing on anybody so uh just because if they don't ask a question they're not ready for an answer yeah that's how i see it anyway. so i'm sure you've met a lot of interesting people uh oh in yeah i have i have talked with you know I spoke with professors, and I, I was in Moscow speaking to the Darwin Museum of National Science and had dinner with the, the senator there and taken into Siberia, one of the woods, wild country there. They were for the wild man with wow. two different two different scientists. And, uh, yeah, I've, I've done that. I've been in Nepal. I've been on the back of an elephant for a week. <laughs> I was there for a month. <laughs> elephant gets you sore, those wooden cages. Uh, so this, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's fun and, uh, I enjoy it. 
Has there ever been a time where you've come to a point where maybe you had one thought, like it's, it's this, and then you had an experience that just changed your, your perception of it and it really changed how you viewed it? Uh, I think it's just been kind of a growing process for me, one step at a time. Mm. As I learn new things, uh, I, I, it, it'll automatically change your thought process if it's something new. But that's a good part about being open-minded. Uh, yeah, I used to, when people would tell me, oh, I saw one disappear, well, or the like, trackway stopped. Well, <laughs> no, nah, that don't work. But I didn't say that. I just thought, okay, I'll put that in my head and just keep it there. And it happened to me. My daughter saw one one morning. We found the trackway, and I just, the trackway was deep. We couldn't even make a print in the trackway. And whatever made that was heavy. Then it just stopped. <clears throat> and I thought, oh, Okay, I look up the tree. I look for boulders I could have jumped to or stepped on or something. Looked all over. Couldn't find where it went anywhere. And that, that kept me where I was going, which was in quantum physics. How does that happen? How does that, how does their, can their mass really change into energy only? Well, yeah, things can change into energy only. I think that may be an attribute they've either evolved into or been given to by whatever made them, whatever changed their DNA. Because uh, I think a lot of, uh, a lot of things exist in something we can't see with our eyes. So you have to get your third eye open and try to just receive what's meant for you to receive and deal with it through your heart. Absolutely. I didn't answer your question very well, did I? <laughs> but no, it's, you know, but, but no, I mean, <clears throat> just you originally, your thought process originally, like keeping your thoughts to yourself, but you stayed open to the idea that even though those tracks stopped, you know, you, you logged that in your mind. So but then you came yeah. to a different understanding of it. Well, it's been, yeah, it's been shown through the studies we've had done and people that's listened to these are professionals that these frequencies goes out of the human range. I mean, they're all over the board, just everywhere. So I have no doubt that they can go in the infrasound if they want to, they can go to ultrasound. We don't hear those. We feel, right. we feel infrasound. We don't hear it. And that could have been what paralyzed me one time up there, me and another guy when we was walking towards one of these creatures. So all of a sudden we got frozen into a box. But we, we understand that there's uh, there's things going on we don't understand. And uh, if they can do those things and change their matter into energy only through their vocal mechanism, which is and create a vibrational frequency that would change their mass into energy, that accounts for that. And that's supposedly possible through quantum physics. So you got frozen. It oh, couldn't boy. move. Couldn't move. Well, it couldn't go forward. We'd go right. backwards. <laughs> and we, we was walking right towards this uh, tree where we thought this creature was had been mouthing off. We jumped out of the shelter and said, we'll see it run away. Well, we didn't see it run away. So we started creeping up towards it. Now, at that time, we was getting pretty bold because they hadn't eaten us yet. So we started creeping up towards this tree, and we was probably you know, several feet apart. And all of a sudden, he got stopped the same time I did. And we just couldn't get any further. And uh, I relate it in my book as a force field, like in Star Trek, you know, it's like something just stops you. And uh, we go backwards and he said, he told me, so I don't know about you, but I can't go anymore. I said, I can't either. And uh, so we went back, as soon as I got back in the shelter, it starts mouth off here, like I had a toy with us, you know. <laughs> but I brought this up to a scientist, uh, Dr. Leroy Fish, actually years later, who's passed away now. And he says, you know, science can't handle your feelings and your emotions well science should handle our feelings and emotions <laughs> most of the accounts of these things are you know get into some of this quacky stuff called quantum physics but uh, he said i would say that was either infrasound or pheromones because infrasound will affect you pheromones only work for the same species though so i thought well the time it has to be infrasound because we're different species right well maybe we're not so now i have to question what did stop us? Was it infrasound? Was it pheromones? Or was it something else? It was something that happened to me one other time in the woods up there when I was walking by myself. Okay. Wasn't thinking about Bigfoot at all. Just all of a sudden, bam, you got to stop. You look around, the hair stands up on your neck, you know. And what is it? You know, looking around, don't see a thing. But now, was it cloaked? Was it even there? Or was it my own emotions playing tricks on me? Mm -hmm. You got to always question yourself during these things. Did something out from the outside bring that into your mind? Or, or was it really something going on? It's your own brain. So always now I, I, I tell people like I did in 2011, I started making notes of everything because when you're by yourself, especially 
something happens, you need to make a note and keep a record of it because you'll question yourself later if you don't and uh, be very objective about it and don't try to make something out of nothing. You know, just a lot of people do. You know, they hear strange sounds they haven't heard before and it's a Bigfoot. No, you can't do that. <laughs> you got to know. And I, I knew when that night in 2011, I was up there by myself and the thing started, they started chattering. It was the last really good interaction I had. And uh, I say interaction. Uh, they were confronting me with chatter. I got it. I, did I mention this already? I, the mosquitoes were so bad. No. I went there by myself, which you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> I don't encourage that. You need someone to look over your shoulder. You know, you need, you need someone to corroborate what's going on. You use the buddy system. <laughs> yeah, you always. But I had somebody planned to go up there with me. Scott Nelson, the crypto linguist, and I had been up there three times, stayed a week at a time. Um, and things happened, but nothing you could really put your finger on to say for sure. That was, you know, you hear this over here, then all of a sudden it's over there. And it doesn't fit with the environment at all, but you still can't say mm. it's a Bigfoot. You can say, well, I wonder what that was. But this, the night when I went back up there by myself, because the guy had his schedule backed out, I got up there and uh, the stuff started happening while it was still daylight early in the evening. And mosquitoes were so bad, I was trying to fan them off. And I said, I'm just going to get in this little tent. I met a little one man tent. The shelter is about to crumble down anyway. Closing in, the trees are just getting bigger and bigger, <laughs> and we're not getting skinnier these days. You know? <laughs> so, anyway, uh, I got in that tent and uh, I was reading, <clears throat> and all of a sudden, wham! And right outside my tent, the big old bam goes. I, I read it as a tree knock at the time, but because they do knock on trees, at least we think that. Well, I'm pretty sure they do. I was hearing the rhythmic. I, I recorded that rhythmic pounding of trees, mm. uh, uh, but what? What was that? So I wait there. I knew I knew what it was. That's how they announce themselves sometimes. And uh, so I waited for a few minutes, and I went outside. Still, mosquitoes were bad, so I'm out there waving my flag. And I said this on a program yesterday. I said maybe they thought I was surrendering or something. <laughs> Took the mosquitoes off of me, <laughs> and, and I, I just started calling out to them. I said, "You know, come on out. Uh, I want to see you. I, I won't." I'll try not to be afraid, but don't scare me later when it gets dark, you know, and uh, I, nothing happened. No, no interaction at all. So I get back in the tent and start getting dark. I don't want to be out there. You know, you just don't want to be out there. So I get inside the tent, check out my recorder, you know, and got a brand new lithium battery in it. Got it all ready to go. Nothing. So I'm laying there, you know, kind of in that alpha state of mindset and, uh, I hear this chattering going on, and it wasn't right outside the tent, but it was well, several yards away, uh, probably 50 yards away, maybe. But it's what they do. It's their chatter, and you recognize it from the speed of it and how it's going. And, and uh, then I hear pop right outside. There's a, this barrel that we have by our stove, which we took years ago, and we put trash in it, and, and that's what we do. I heard something hit it. And, uh, and then bipedal elephant starts walking around around out there uh, i think uh oh I, I yelled out i said i told you not to come back later and scare me <laughs> i'm sitting there with just a little 38 with the bird shot in it oh, to man. scare the bear off or something you know that's all i got because i'm not going to shoot at these things unless right. i'm threatened and sure. even then i don't know that your gun would have done any good but they know that they, they know i'm not a threat to them i think i think they know that and uh anyway uh Whatever it was, I heard it walking around, and all of a sudden it just came up by my little tent and stood there, and that's all I heard. Nothing else. Didn't hear it walk away, but that's all that happened until four o'clock that morning. When, by the way, I didn't sleep a lot that night. <laughs> I was just you. laying there wondering you know, what, what else. And four o'clock that morning, I hear this electrical metallic type sound right outside my tent, and that's another thing you can't put your finger on. What was that? It was very, I couldn't even describe it. I wish I could have recorded it, but my battery was dead, by the way, the oh, lithium man. battery, when I tried to record this earlier. So, you know, there I am. And I went up there with a three-day supply of power bars. I think I should have left one out, because I think that's what this thing was walking around out there for. They like our food, at least they have in the past. And uh keeps from eating raw deer meat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I, uh, anyway, I got up the next morning, as soon as the sun came up, took the tent down and uh shot out of there 
because my my question had been answered are they still around because really nothing def def definitively had happened when scott and i were up there three times earlier that summer uh so i left out and that satisfied me then when the thing happened in 2016 that light saber looking thing went by us well there's still some strangeness in that area and i don't know if it's a portal but uh, i don't know you know somebody come down to me for calling something a portal one time well, you know nasa's been studying portals for years it looked at magnetic fields uh yeah they happen most of us have heard about the skinwalker ranch you know mm -hmm. uh there you are i mean our government invested millions of dollars in that study there and and never did get an answer and they sold it to like bigelow and he sold it to somebody else but i don't know what kind of things have gone on i've never been there i've flown over it i a private pilot i had my own airplane i was flown over a time or two but i've never been there on the ground to you get locked out anyway you got to be invited <laughs> yeah. i had somebody tell me they could get me in there if i want to go in there I'm like, okay but it never happened so mm. uh that'd be kind of interesting to experience those things uh yeah a lot a lot of things going on i just encourage anybody to keep an open mind with it because i think we're going to be inundated with uh more ufo material more alien material we're going to understand that the universe is bigger than anybody thought it could ever be. Uh, I know years ago when I was got into quantum physics, I said, you know, uh, if everything's measurable and predictable, like Newtonian physics says, somebody tell me how far it is to the end of the universe. That's when I got kicked out of the club, I think, because you can't answer that question. You know, could there be an end to it? I thought about that since a little kid. How could there be an end to the universe? What would it be there? A wall? What would be on the other side of the wall? How can there be an end? That kind of makes you open your mind, whether you want to or not. You got to realize there could be no end. Well, if there could be no end, that means there was probably no beginning. How do we get our head around that stuff? Right. You know, it just it's it's hard. You you really need in this three dimensional reality that we live in, we think is real. Uh, it's hard to understand things that are outside of that. We're just we're made to evolve into that, I think, and learn more. I think that's what's happening in these, in these days we're in now, is where more and more people are opening up their minds to this. I'm happy about that. And if I can influence that, good for me. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, sincerely, you know, you, you've done such great work. Where can folks find you on the internet? Uh, RonMoorhead.com. It's R-O-N-M-O-R-E-H-E-A-D.com. Or Bigfoot sounds, but Ron Moorhead's easier to get to. It goes both the same. That's where my CDs, which I've produced two CDs with the sounds narrated by me and Jonathan Frick, Star Trek. Uh, they're both about 40 minutes long. They've got the sounds that we're recording integrated into the story. You can hear those on CD and buy them as a download or the hard copy. Well, no, you can't get the hard copy online. You have to order that through one of the stores that carries them. And that's like the BigfootStore.com or or the uh, Sasquatch Outpost, uh, Bailey, Colorado, and there's also one in Forks, Washington. Anyway, they're online. You can find them if you look. And then I got my two books, The Quantum Bigfoot and Voices in the Wilderness. And that's my first book, my chronicle of doing all this for so many years. And it comes with a download so you can get the sounds that I'm talking about, the context of the sounds I talk about in the book. You can hear the sound that I'm talking about. That's great. And that's pretty popular. Uh, the second CD is the Quantum Bigfoot. That's where it's taken me, uh, where it's going, where I'm going with my thoughts. So, RonMoorhead.com. Awesome. Any uh, any plans for another book? That's strange. I just mentioned my wife yesterday. Uh, uh, yeah, there's so much more going on. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of think I want to, then I talk myself out of it because it's just, <laughs> it's a lot of work. Uh, mm -hmm. The Quantum Bigfoot yeah. was all over Voices in the Wilderness was easy. It's just my story, my chronicle. Sure. It was easy to write, and uh, I put the sounds in, big deal. And then Quantum Bigfoot, though, I did a lot of homework on that, making sure I didn't get something out of place, you know, just studying on it. took me a couple of years to write that, and I had to step away from it, just more studying than get back into it. And I, I relate the, uh, uh, the subtitle of Quantum Bigfoot is bringing science and spirituality back together because quantum science and spirituality are synonymous and that's tesla so you get that and but you also got max plaque which i quoted 
um, science dies one funeral at a time. <laughs> you know, science grows one funeral at a time. <laughs> That's what he said. I like that statement because it takes the, a new science mind, a new new physicist, new people with open minds to get a hold of this. Because classical science, they're in a their parameters of what they've been taught, and they won't get out of that. Or they lose their credibility with uh, with the folks, and they don't want to lose their credibility. They don't want to lose their funding for the next project. They don't want to lose their tenure. You know, they, they are, and I know, I knew Dr. Krantz, you know, I read about him, he took a hit for taking on the Gigantopithecus, that these big foots were even around. They don't get into physics like I do. In fact, they won't even touch it because it's outside the prayer room. They're outside their parameters of study. And again, they won't, they won't tackle it. But I take my hands off to the, the couple that I do know that are into it and, and are really working and trying to, uh, to establish something credible. And Dr. Melton is one of those. He's trying to work towards uh, bringing this thing to light for academia. That's awesome. Well, good deal. You get any uh, any book recommendations besides your own for anyone else to check out if they're interested? Uh, just go online. You know, Google it. Uh, you'll find uh, Quantum Physics 101. Uh, I think it started me out on uh, a couple of guys from uh, Santa Cruz State uh, wrote a book on quantum physics, uh, The Enigmas. I think it is, mm. but there's others out now. You know, if you get those, they're easy to read because you can understand it. You know, you get into Schrodinger and Bohr and these old physicists that really got into this. It's the new science. And really, if people want to understand how things work, they've got to get into that science. You can't just take Newtonian physics by itself. You've got to get into quantum physics. And uh, and uh, in my opinion, uh, too, if you really want to understand what's going on and what your life's all about and da-da-da-da-da, I love Ron. that. <laughs> Ron, thank you so much for doing this today. I, honestly, I'm, I'm honored that you took the time to do this. Really oh, thank you for inviting me. I, that's what I do, JC. Uh, I just appreciate you inviting me on. And there you have it. I cannot thank Ron enough. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I loved how we were able to get into so many different avenues and facets of belief systems. Whether we were talking about spirituality or even quantum physics, I'm just enamored by Ron's thirst for knowledge and wanting to know. Just talking about the shifting in consciousness and in the paradigm as a whole for people being more open and more accepting to the possibilities of a different kind of reality than what we've been indoctrinated into. We also talked about Ron's books. His first book, Voices in the Wilderness, in which you can get an audio version of that book, which includes some of the Sierra sounds, as well as his newest book, Quantum Bigfoot. If you want to learn more about Ron and all his research, you can find more information at ronmoorhead.com, as well as bigfootsounds.com. Please be sure to rate the episode. If you're watching the episode, be sure to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and hit that notification bell. Thank you all so much for joining us on this journey. Until next time, take care of one another and keep thinking for yourself.